Hello, everyone. I just had to fetch a piece of paper. I had to put down uh, my presentation on paper uh, just to be helpful for the interpreters, but I'll try to combine <coughs> reading and speaking, being spontaneous. So my topic is the creation of man um, in dramaturgy. Uh, we can, uh, I, I uh, got this idea about the topic when I uh, came across a book by Father Nikolai Sakharov, I Love, Therefore I Am. This book um, uh, contains uh, the reflections uh, by Saint Sofroni on the persons of uh, uh, on the persons of the Trinity. And when I read it, it somehow began to seem familiar to me. I realized that it's very similar to what is said in dramaturgy about the character, the building of a character, the creation and the performance of, uh, of a character in theater or in, or in, in cinema. Dramaturgy basically is the science of uh, building up the st structure of a story and uh, about presenting the story. Uh, dramaturgy gives uh, and adds some tension into time or orders time in a certain way so that it would uh, uh, be become more captivating. There are different uh, stories, of course, uh, with different beginnings and endings, um, stories with a certain development, uh, but there's also cyclical dramaturgy, a kind of a circular dramaturgy that uh, repeats itself and the ending reaches the beginning. And nowadays there are several theories of dramaturgy where for instance, you can uh, create this uh, structure based uh, on, the, on natural phenomena. For instance, you can go by um, something like a winding river or a spiral or like an explosion. So there are several ways of building up a story. One can, uh, the, the, a, uh, a story can be completely disconnected, of course, as the Estonian nursery rhyme goes, that the mouse was jumping around, the cat was jumping around, and the old bear was beating the drum. So these are just the disconnected uh, pieces, um, brief pieces that ha are not necessarily uh, connected to each other. But every form of dram dramaturgy or every choice expresses some idea of uh, the human being as such. Um, and it has to do with the notion of time. Uh, it's a European, maybe a Christian notion that uh, time has its beginning and its end. Or we can uh, view it as something cyclical something that's recurrent, but each form expresses the core, and the core is always the human being. When at the film school we first started studying dramaturgy, almost all the students had some kind of an aversion to this subject. It felt so oppressive uh, to have so many rules about how to tell a story, how to develop a character, but when we um, started to make our first short films, um, all of a sudden, all these topics became relevant all of a sudden. That's because... Uh, because we tend to live in quite an automatic way in normal circumstances, so we are not aware of what we're doing. We get up in the morning, we brush our teeth, we go somewhere, and this is the way things are. But once we end up uh, on stage or in front of the camera, uh, suddenly all of this uh, natural uh, state of being is gone, it has disappeared. There is nothing more unnatural for a human being than being on stage or, or being in front of a camera. All of the uh, 
automatic behavior is uh, gone all of a sudden. All that's left are the questions of what I'm doing here, uh, why am I doing this, where do I put my hands, um, should I sit, should I stand, what do I, what do I want, maybe I want to get out of here. And uh, all of these questions are addressed by dramaturgy because it helps uh, um, filmmakers um, or drama stage directors. The first major work of dramaturgy in Europe is Aristotle's Poetics, uh, 335 before Christ. And in it, um, he analyzes Sophocles' tragedy, Oedipus Rex. And Aristotle discovers that uh, drama is characterized by anagnorisis, the moment of recognition, the moment of tragic recognition, something that is life-changing. When Oedipus Rex learns from an oracle that he has killed his father and married his mother, that's one example of a life-changing uh, life event. And another central Aristotelian concept was catharsis, or when the audience has watched the story of someone coming to know something that will change their life, and the audience should feel fear and uh, uh, empathize with the characters. And another example that is given in dramaturgy of a life-changing event is, uh, can be uh, how Saul becomes Paul on the road to Damascus. This is also a life-changing life event. The event has to be a, a really major one that would open people up as, as deeply as possible. For example, the Russian formalists, uh, specifically Vladimir Prop, who became famous for arguing that a character ha has only 31 functions and that it, it is technically impossible to create more than 31 stories. So the, they're all variants of the same uh, story and you cannot create more than uh, 31. He studied um, uh, fairy tales, uh, magic fairy tales, and he argued that their uh, forms are actually linked to the cults and rituals of lost religions. He gave an example of a person in a fairy tale being presented with a choice between helping an animal or a character who will later repay him, and whether it's worth it. It's, in other words, it's just a basic um, a choice between good and evil. And uh, he said that it is a kind of a religious motive uh, that has to do with weighing one's soul. All of the Western European uh, theatre is based on uh, the rituals of um, Dionysius and the Indian theatre uh, also has its roots in, in religious uh, practices. And Prop uh, argues that his theory uh, applies only to ancient dead religions. That he says that the living religion does not create fairy tales, it only, they only change them. So it's, um, this theory is quite uh, conditional and hypothetic, uh, uh, hypothetical as befits formalism, but um, it also says that um, it still it, it has to do with the deepest experiences of the human soul, which is the, the weighing of one's soul. And one of the things that um, uh, struck me in the teaching about the uh, Holy Trinity uh, by Saint Sophroni is that uh, this person's the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, that there is a kind of a participatory uh, relationship between them. That it's, they are not uh, um, separated as individuals, but they are connected by a bond of love. So if someone loves, then he becomes a who, not a what. 
he becomes living. For Sofroni, the, a person of, of the Trinity is not a static being, but it's a dynamic person. He's someone who manifests himself through action, through, through loving, through love. And here we have actually come to the most important uh, statements of uh, Western European uh, dramaturgy. The character is not static, it's not a type of good or bad, father or mother, or a nape, or like Oedipus, but it is uh, uh, someone who is doing something who is, ma who is manifesting himself yeah. through action uh, and through relationships with others. And only under these conditions uh, we can create a living character and uh, it becomes <coughs> possible for an actor to present this character on stage. So acting can be described as uh, being in the middle of an ocean. An actor is connected to everyone, uh, to the partner, stage partner, um, to the sound engineers, uh, to everything. So basically it's the relations with the others that create the character. We have also heard the saying that the court creates the king. So everyone approaches oneself through the others. Only through the others a character can be formed. And in drama, in dramaturgy, we see that our brother is our life, which is another quote uh, uh, by Saint Siluan. So if I'm alive, if I am doing something, if I'm loving, that makes me someone, that makes me alive. And the uh, stage directing is also uh, giving life uh, to the character, is bringing, uh, blowing life into someone. The director is uh, giving life, the actor is giving life to a character and the audience is participating in this process through what is already existent within uh, the audience. So not only the persons of the Trinity are involved in this participatory relationship, but we all are in a participatory relationship with each other. We are all one. We share our inner life with each other. And it is understandable to everyone because deep down we are one. Uh, in uh, cinema there is um, a profession called um, a script doctor. Uh, he analyzes the story and gives uh, feedback um, uh, to the script writer and they say what can be improved on the story, what are the good sides, the bad sides in the story. And the main uh, question that the script doctor would ask uh, a screenwriter is, uh, what does your character actually want? And everyone, of course, can invent what this character wants. Uh, what you can be more or less inventive uh, in giving an answer to this question. But uh, mostly, the script doctors are trying to nudge you in the, direc in the direction of finding an answer where the screenwriter himself asks himself, "What do I want?" So both uh, the, uh, the, when the author starts writing the story according to what he wants, all of a sudden the story comes alive. So this is a practical tip. So everything is connected, um, um, the screenwriter, the, um, the director, the actor, the audience, uh, they are all interconnected. So it's a shared common understanding. It, um, 
sounds uh, quite self-evident, but uh, this participatory relationship is actually based on this principle. We are sharing our personal inner impulses. So we are sharing the likeness that we all have within us. We are sharing that with each other. We can also share negative and aggressive, aggressive impulses. And the script doctors say that the character can be as bad as it gets. It can do the worst deeds. But uh, what is important is that the uh, audience uh, understands him why he is doing these deeds. And Saint Sophroni writes that the state of love creates understanding. Love is the source of uh, knowing. So through compassion it is pos possible to understand uh, even the craziest and insanest of characters. So the same relationship, Trinitarian relationship of love, also applies to the greatest sinner. Your character can be the worst of sinners, but uh, the viewer understands him. I have done the same, maybe in different circumstances, maybe in different proportions, but they, they would understand that I have faced the same dilemmas, I have faced the same choices in my life, maybe on a different scale. And once you uh, uh, view it this way, you become compassionate, you start um, understanding this character, you start fearing for them, and this is, um, uh, this is actually a loving perspective. So the Aristotelian uh, uh, um, catharsis or fear and compassion is after all a state of love, and this uh, uh, relationship is actually very personal. Saint Sofroni also stresses that uh, this relationship of love is subjective, it's not objective. And the uh, uh, um, dramaturgy um, or screenwriting uh, textbooks also suggest that uh, you have to uh, be subjective. You should not um, go forth from generalizations. Uh, some things are articulate, but um, something, but it can also be implied. But uh, even the implications have to be subjective, subjective, and that's uh, best because the viewer wants to discover from themselves, not to be pointed at and uh, be taken, uh, be led by the hand to to what uh, there really is. So the viewer wants to say that I saw something in there, and maybe the director. Uh, or the screenwriter doesn't even know about something that's in a story, but only the viewer would know. We had a teacher at our uh, theater school in Moscow who told us that uh, that uh, was quite graphic in his expressions. He said that the viewer is such a pig, he wants to discover everything himself. He wants to receive everything personally within himself. So this is indeed a, a great skill that the viewer can uh, receive these implications and make his own conclusions. The viewer is much happier when he understands in these implications instead of uh, being uh, uh, offered them uh, fully ready-made. Saint Sofroni adds that language cannot uh, actually uh, uh, transfer to us uh, what is going on within um, a person or within the persons of the Trinity. How to depict a person who is uh, so vast that uh, it reaches from hell to heaven, that contains both heaven and hell, or as Dostoevsky said, that you look into a man's soul and um, your head starts spinning. It's like an endless well. 
You can say everything. Um, you can say everything, but you don't need to say everything. You can say it, but you can, if you say it too much, then you can ruin it. Another, another saint, Saint Porphyrius, uh, says that the most righteous Christians are like poets. They can change registers. We can also read the scripture in different registers. We can read it poetically, we can understand it historically or in moral categories. And also the images that we see there, um, they are basically like metaphors. So in, in drama arts, we're not talking about um, one particular story, but we're talking about different approaches. We can um, talk about the symbolism, the surrealism, different isms that we can uh, go forth from. But it is not a question of differences of genre. It is said that all of these currents or schools of thoughts, sco schools of thought, they are um, like units of uh, human understanding that are specific to the human mind. The human mind has a sense um, of the absurd, a sense of the sublime, uh, or, or a sense of the tragic, or a sense of the surreal, or things happening subconsciously. Why, they don't know, they cannot understand, but uh, this is the experience that uh, is familiar to all human beings. To be able to see things um, by way of images, uh, as if in poetry, that is um, essential in understanding, in the understanding of life. I remember a good friend of mine who first uh, submitted his poems to a literary magazine called uh, Vikargar or the Rainbow, and there was an editor who uh, told him that. Uh, do not describe your uh, feelings or your thoughts, but uh, create an image in your poetry that would uh, uh, give rise to the same images and thoughts in their minds. So you don't need to explain, but you should rather use uh, imagery. Imagery is a poetic language that will begin to work uh, on its own. To some people, they don't, say, they don't say anything. They don't mean anything to them. But the image can uh, bring you to a certain state of mind. It can elevate you. It can... Uh, uh, it can uh, also bring you to a, a lower state. But Saint Sophroni is writing exactly of a, of, a, of a state that the relationship is. It's um, as if being immersed in something. So understanding comes through a state, through an experience. So there are all, there's a certain concept in film too, the film about a certain state of being, uh, for instance, Tarkovsky's films. But it doesn't uh, have to be necessarily something tragic or tra something serious. Uh, you're watching it, you don't uh, quite know what actually happened there, but uh, you feel uplifted. You are um, excited. And for Fellini as well, uh, we can say that they are a lot about the state of uh, being. It's hard to describe exactly what's happening there, what the plot is. But uh, for instance, for Fellini, the stories have a lot to do with his childhood, with a very fresh and uh, vigorous, powerful experiences of a very young person. So these poetic images are, after all, based on, uh, on a reality that the director has uh, experienced. And now they have been uh, taken into pieces 
and uh, presented separately. So this imagery uh, comes uh, from somewhere. An example from Estonian theatre uh, innovation wave in the 1960s, 60s, uh, initiated by Jan Doming and Evald Helmakula, and the first um, production was a poetry evening, poetry by Gustav Suits, Estonian poet. Uh, it was called An Evening of Suits, and young actors actually took uh, poetic imagery from Gustav Suits and started acting them out through action on the stage. For example, the first line in, in the piece was, listen, the earth is shaking, and the actors started trampling on the stage, and it actually sh started shaking. But the poem itself is about the revolution of 1905. The, the actual situation where demonstrators are marching through the streets, you, you can hear it, you can feel the earth moving. So through this imagery of the poem, the actors took us back to what actually happened. So poetic imagery was retranslated into reality. So uh, creating imagery is not random, it's always based on real life realistic experience. So if Russian formalists are saying that behind fairy stories uh, we have the concept of weighing of souls, then of course the, the claim itself is poetic and, and perhaps conditional. Uh, we don't know how the weighing of souls actually happens, but we feel that this might be a reality. This is something that may be possible. It is a realistic experience. And coming back to the uh, ideas by script doctors, they say that the more you torture your character as the script writer, the more the character will be loved by the public. The, the, the audience loves watching suffering, because this is the recognition of their own suffering. A true hero is generated based on whether and how he or she overcomes their suffering. Saint Sophronis says that suffering brings forth the hidden potential in people. Uh, suffering increases force. The character does not know in advance what is going to happen to him. The public doesn't know. The audience doesn't know uh, how strong the character is, whether they will be able to come out of the situation. Both the, the audience and the character are sort of, sort of crossing a canyon on a, tight, on a you know, narrow rope. Uh, Saint Sophroni says that the spiritual experience is actually like walking across or above a deep canyon. Our path to God starts from hell. Before ascent, there is descent. And a similar experience is depicted in dramaturgy by a concept called the dramatic arc. So we have a story that begins, the person understands something, learns something, they start moving in certain direction, and then they face an obstacle and fall. It's called the lowest point in dramaturgy. And then, after the lowest point, there has to be a solution, because deep inside, deep within, the viewer is hoping that the character would not keep suffering, that there would be a redemption. Of course, there are films where the characters do badly and it all ends by the character doing badly, but the audience will be discontented. They feel that this cannot be this, you, you cannot end on the lowest point or on a low note. It would be a rude disregard for the rules of composition, although you know there have been directors who have done that. So the hero can get killed, 
But on the spiritual level, on the mental level, the story has to elevate the viewer to another level. So the death of the character needs to elevate the viewer. Saint Sophroni says that even if the flesh dies, the persona, the, the person within, uh, is spiritual, which uh, makes it possible to resurrect. And this faith and hope is sub subconsciously really characteristic of us human, and it's depicted by the drama rules. The death of a character must actually raise up the viewer, must redeem the viewer. Behind the cross there is joy. This is what dramaturgic rules tell to us as well. Uh, emotions may raise up a human, and the emotions need not necessarily be sublime or beautiful. The emotions might be related to some kind of a division, push the viewer towards contemplating the dark side of life or, or contemplating even the underworld. The art cannot overlook the darker side. And I recently read an article about Romanos the Melodist, a creator of the uh, hymns in the Byzantine liturgy, and the book uh, mentions that uh, he is a very good dramatist of the contrast between heavens and the the underworld or the hell. Uh, in hymns, desire is not uh, lost or effaced, but it is merged with the divine. Uh, hymns talk about things outside of their nature. The song may be very beautiful while speaking about something really sinful. At the same time, we might have a story about something that is really, uh, really depressing, but be really beautiful at the same time. In dramaturgy, the same um, notion has been described as the estrangement effect. If we talk about Bertolt Brecht, then for him the most important thing was that the viewer should learn something about the nature of things, not being uh, overrun by uh, emotions. Brecht, for example, had an example of a tragic event, a car accident, a very simple woman, a washing woman has seen it and now she is trying to retell the accident but the, but the retold accident is no longer tragical it might even be comical so the important part that the narrator is trying to underline is the nature what actually happened not the emotion related to it and when we speak about the orthodox teachings on beauty I mean, it applies to icons specifically. Uh, there is this aspect of avoidance of passion or, or, or disinterestedness, avoidance of human psychology. If we have icons describing tragical events, torture, murder, they are depicted in a sort of a distanced way, without human pain. If we look at uh, our Numa church and the uh, icon of uh, St. John the Baptist, uh, we have uh, the image of him being decapitated. The executioner has a slight smile. John the Baptist has a slight smile. I mean, the style is, you know, sweet and naive, but it's a way of perceiving things. We cannot actually put it into words, but, but we can see that this way of, of representing events is, is not specifically realistic, 
but it is godly. They, they create sort of a mystical connection between the human psychology and the God, and the idea in itself is, is not conceptual, but it's, it's I'd say, professional. It, it creates this feeling of, of gentleness or beauty. In Spain, they have a specific word for it, duende. It is used in performative arts um, to descri describe performative arts where uh, beauty and darkness are intertwined. I learned this word when I was uh, uh, directing uh, Federico, Federico Garcia Lorca, and Lorca has defined duende. It's the entanglement of beauty and darkness. For example, for him, a Catholic procession is duende, uh, combining death and beauty. Um, Bullfighting is to end there. Beautiful, gracious uh, bullfighter is fighting with the bull for their lives. Uh, flamenco is to end there. Painful human relations depicted by way of elegant dance, it's carried by pain. And Lorca also underlined that duende, this, this marriage between death and beauty, he, he always underlined that his theatre was duende, there always had to be duende. That duende always carries a risk for the performer, a special kind of intensity. Uh, according to Lorca, essentially his actor should be uh, should be using a hammer to uh, put a nail in his own head. The, this actor is not not thinking. Fado, also a duende uh, form, uh, when a singer starts to sing Fado, he cries out first. He sort of cuts the air with a cry, and then. The, by this cry, he elevates himself to a different level in intensity, uh, as if he was about to fly. And after such a cry, he cannot sort of withdraw shyly or, you know, um, come back down. If somebody in this hall uh, cried out loud, you, you, you know, people wouldn't go on as if nothing had happened. The cry would remain in the air. It's intensive. It's flying around. So this car cry is, is, is a sign. I am going to fly now. I am going to take this risk. And, and now coming back to where we started, uh, when a human person, actor, displays their emotions very actively, aggressively, they have to be aware of what they are doing and why. In dramaturgy, um, is, is a set of rules that has tried to acknowledge and formulate uh, the characteristics of the human soul on a very deep level. And if we compare this to the ideas of Saint Sophroni, uh, then we understand that our soul, the life our soul leads, is, is not random. There are rules. How the soul operates. We cannot define it on a rational level, but it's real. Uh, Fernando Pessoa has described this experience. A book of uh, on being anxious and it says it's difficult to describe feelings when a person realizes that they actually exist, that soul is something real, that could be described by God knows what words.
So I think that dramatic art exists thanks uh, to the reasons why it is being performed, why it is being watched, that it is based on the reality that everyone feels, acknowledges subconsciously. First of all, that human is immortal. Secondly, that humans have been created by the, a loving God and we are like him. So drama, dramatic art teaches us that we are immortal and that we are able to love one another. Thank you.